thanks uh, well thanks everyone for for joining our webinar i think we have an, an interesting topic today again um tale of two shoppers um david will talk a bit about pricing after the the COVID crisis uh, i think we're all hoping that we'll get to a, a more normal um business again uh we we've actually had one pricing after COVID, was probably a bit premature about a year ago um david will be a bit critical about our predictions from back then. Uh, that's okay. Um, so let's let's get started. Uh, bef before we dive into the topic, um, just very briefly on us. Um, so I'll, I'll be the, the sidekick today. My name is Ingo Reinhardt, co-founder, managing director of Binomics uh, with a long history in, in pricing, also before founding Binomics together with David Holtz, Senior uh, Director uh, or Sales Director, uh, also with a long history in pricing and deep industry knowledge, particularly in, in the CPG business. If you have any questions uh, during the course of the webinar, uh, please write them into the chat and we uh, will answer all of them at the end. If we don't have time for every question, um, then we will definitely answer them by email. So please let us know. Uh, we, we often have a very lively discussion to, towards the end uh, and we hope that we will have the same here today. Uh, briefly on, on the background, uh, for those who, who are new, so uh, Binomics, uh, we founded the company three years ago um, based on a strong understanding of the industry and pricing method, methods. Uh, um, Sebastian, my co-founder and myself, uh, we developed and are building, further building a SaaS solution that helps our customers make better pricing and product decisions. Um, and we're already um, have a global footprint across a, a broad range of countries um, and are uh, working across a broad range of industries. I would say a main focus is in uh, telecommunications, uh, CPG, uh, and a number of, of similar industries. So if, um, if you have a challenge, please let us know. And if you think uh, this can be addressed via a software pricing solution, then um, we are definitely interested in talking to you. So enough of the introduction, I'll, I'll hand over to David uh, to talk about pricing after COVID. Perfect. Thank you, Ingo. And good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world today. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. So there's three topics that we're going to be covering today. So as Ingo pointed out, we did a similar presentation about April last year in terms of what our predictions would be um, in pricing and, and, and what we'd need to look for in a, in a post-pandemic um, world. Um, then we're going to look at what's happened since. So we know more information. Um, and then we've got also got some custom uh, research that we'll be sharing with you today. And then the last point is that we'll be focusing on um, the things that you need to be looking out for um, going forward and some of our recommendations for the next step. So on the left-hand side of the screen were our four key areas that we suggested may happen um, after the pandemic. And I'll group them together. So um, the first ones being that there was a struggle for survival for many firms and there'll be less competition for the, for the people that, that do survive. Um, I suppose what did happen, yeah, there was lots of struggle across lots of industries, lots of people furloughed, um, particular categories were more impacted than others. So likes of CPGs, telcos, software held up pretty well, but you've got the likes of hospitality sector still being at risk. So we can tick, tick the first part. We don't want to be pleased to have predicted that correctly, but it's, it is something that we looked at last year and it has um, come out as, as it is. Um, the next one is when we looked at how people's uh, preferences and demand would have been reshaped based on the, the pandemic and it creating a, a long term um, equilibrium that may be established. And I suppose we can kind of tick these off as well. So we have seen huge swings for certain categories and pent up demand. If we think about things like holidays that people were unable to go on, there's more of a demand for those sorts of things to happen um, now. Um, and things like restaurants and pubs being shut. So we weren't able to do certain things. So our preferences changed. Um, and also our lifestyles have changed as well. So there's less commuting, there's more homeworking. Um, there's some data we'll be sharing later on about health. So in terms of what people have been purchasing and how often they've been purchasing certain categories or, or, or certain things they've been purchasing for, for um, home entertainment, there are um, 
definite shifts in what people have been doing and preferences in terms of how people have been spending spending their money. So um, from there, there's been things that have, have happened since that we now need to take into account for the next stage of looking at um, uh, our strategies going forward. So I've grouped these into three areas. So the, the first one is the macro trend. So lots of news coming out at the moment about rising commodity prices. Um, there's an interesting article for those of you who um, are based in the UK and um, the Grocer magazine, especially for FMCG, um, people in the FMCG industry, that um, they did a survey on 80 um, FMCG suppliers and 40% of them said they believe that the prices um, on goods will go up by 7% or more in the next year, which is a huge amount of um, prices going forward. And obviously that pricing needs to be passed on. And this also comes into a time where we've got this rise in inflation that's happening. So um, going forward, this is going to be interesting to keep an eye on in terms of it's going to put more pressure on people to make sure they've got the right pricing strategies and product strategies in place. We've got the growth of e-commerce, still not as profitable as brick and mortar. Um, and therefore, a lot of retailers especially are looking for ways to make it more profitable. And off the back of it, we're seeing that a lot of retailers are coming out and saying that they now need to reset their categories. And um, retailers such as Asda are coming out and saying that they're going to take 20 percent out of their range. And if we hold on to this thought, there's um, some data that we've got that will be interesting for that particular topic. And in terms of lifestyle, we know that there's more home working, as we've already touched upon. And there's actually a change to a lot of people's personal financial circumstances as well. So let's touch upon that in a bit more detail. So we surveyed, did some custom research, and we surveyed a number of consumers and we asked them, how are you financially since um, the pandemic? So if we compare your disposable income in 2019 versus what it is now, how are you doing? And actually, it's quite an interesting spread of people who are significantly um, less had significantly less disposable income than they did last year um, and also it was quite an even split across uh, um, significantly more as well and it was interesting that only 35 percent of consumers said they're in the same financial situation they were before and if we think about what might be driving this the significantly less are going to be um, impacted by things like house prices going up the, the inflation that we're starting to see creep in and being in roles and, and jobs that may have been affected by um, the pandemic, like hospitality, uh, sh shop owners that had to close for a, a longer period of time, people in the events industry. And then if we look at the reverse, there are people who, and I kind of use this in quotation marks, like benefited financially from, from the pandemic, not really overall benefited, but in terms of financially, their, their personal circumstances are that they're better off. So they didn't have to pay for a holiday. They've been working from home and haven't had to pay for the commute. They've been saving money on expensive lunches that they may have been eating out. So um, there are different circumstances that we are ultimately seeing. And one of the interesting things about the shape of what we can see here is that this actually gives us some um, broad insight in terms of what this means for price sensitivity. So I hand back over to, to Ingo now just to, to talk about this in a bit more detail. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and it's, uh, it's essentially a, a footnote that I want to add, because I think it's particular for, for those of us um, in focus on, on pricing. I think that that's something very interesting and probably not fully intuitive. Um, and so what we saw on the previous slide is that um, we, we have a share of the population um, that have uh, increased the, in, in their willingness to pay or in their... Um, in their disposable income and we have a, a large share of people with more disposable income than before the pandemic uh, it was about a third who, who pretty much said they would stay the same a third would go down and a third would go up and what that means is we're moving uh, if you look at the two distributions here on the on the side and what what it shows is the distribution in willingness to pay for simplicity here it's a normal distribution in reality it's a little bit different but um, i think for uh displaying the results this year is sufficient. Um, so what we see is that um, we have in, in the current status a certain mean and variance. And, and what we saw, it was about equally equal the number of people with an increase in their disposable income willingness to pay in a decrease. So what happens if we go from the left to the right is that the, the distribution 
got a bit broader. So we have more people with very low, much lower willingness to pay and more people with more willingness to pay. So, and overall we have an increase in the variance and an increase in the variance in terms of pricing means lower elasticity, lower means closer to zero. So people, not individual people, but the whole population overall is becoming uh, less price sensitive. Uh, and I think this is a, an insight that's not fully intuitive, um, but um, it, it's very important for pricing because lower elasticity means, and I just want to show this in a very simple example, um, less sensitivity means, um, and I hope you can, David, you can see my screen now. Yeah. Less sensitivities means you can achieve higher prices, uh, and I think that's that's an interesting opportunity for uh, for everyone involved in in, in revenue management. So um, here um, we have a very simple example. So just a standard product. We're selling fruits, apples, and we have our population, the the pre. COVID population, uh, the cost of an apple to us is 50 cent, current price is, is one euro, and we have a price elasticity in the middle. I can show you this uh, of minus two. This is um, in this example, the, the pre-COVID uh, scenario. So our, um, and we have a population here of uh, interested in the product of 10,000, 10, half buy it at a priceless elasticity of minus two, margin 50%, and so on, all very straightforward. And we're, our profit optimum is here at, at one euro. If we look at um, the price elasticities here, we're, as I said, around minus two. Um, and then what happens is, as in the, in the slide that I showed before, is that the, the variance increases. That means elasticity goes down, and we go from the pre-COVID to the post-COVID um, population. So with more people with lower and more people with a higher uh, willingness to pay. And what happens in this case, everything else is the same, <clears throat> is that, um, and we're already here in the profit optimum, is that the demand, the, the profit optimal price is much higher. Um, and this is because the elasticity decreased. Um, as we saw before, at a price of one euro, we had previously elasticity of minus two. Now it's 1.2 about. And this gives us the opportunity to increase prices further. And if you're in a situation like this, and of course, to apply this in the real world, um, you would have to have a, a, a very detailed understanding of the specifics of your industries. How did willingness to pay really change? How did price sensitivity change? Um, but you can see with this change in this very simple Apple scenario, in the, if we go to the, off, the, the profit optimum, that we're selling fewer apples, um, but we have a higher profit because people are not individual people, but um, the population as a whole has become less price sensitive. And this gives us in pricing the opportunity to uh, achieve a higher pricing if we're interested in profits. And uh, this was a simple example. And by the way, this is our, our tool, really useful for actual pricing decisions. And you can um, do the same, not just with these simple examples, but you can do it, work with real life examples, your own products, competitor products, and it gives you a full overview of what happens in the industry. Also, uh, it gives you insights into um, what would happen if you see that sensitivity changes in the market, uh, how you can take best advantage of that situation. Uh, and I hope this was a little bit insightful because I, to me, it wasn't intuitive in the beginning, but I think this is a, an important insight. If we look at what happens and if we see that we have more people with lower and also more people with a higher willingness to pay, that means the variance increases and that means elasticity goes down, people become, the population overall becomes less price sensitive. And that gives us the opportunity to increase prices. Um, and that's something that's uh, from a pricing perspective, I think very interesting and gives uh, companies the opportunity to, to reposition their, their pricing overall. Uh, and with that, I would hand over back to David. Great, thank you. Um, I think you need to stop sharing your screen first, I'm afraid, because you're the lead, right? 
So thank you very much. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Great. Thanks, Ingo. So I'd like to share a, a case study, um, and uh, this this is a bit weighted towards a UK grocery, but I think it's it's quite relevant because um, it was a, a, a kind of a situation that was born out of the last recession um, back in two thousand and eight, where uh, essentially we saw this interesting trend that started to occur, where and and we we talk about the, the tale of the the two shoppers we saw something start to happen. It was quite a significant change in the UK grocery market um, where we saw that there were some people that were better off and there were some people that were worse off caused by the last recession. And we started to see this effect of a big growth in premium retail with the likes of Waitrose and Ocado. Now, Ocado is a, a, a UK pure play grocery um, e-com retailer so that was at the start of this sort of journey so you take that into account but we, we did see um, huge growth in those those retailers and we also saw a big growth in discount retail as well um, across Audi and Lidl now prior to the recession those four retailers together had approximately and I've rounded these numbers approximately eight percent of of sales in in UK grocery and now they represent 21% and, and Audi is the UK's fifth largest um, retailer. So they've made a huge impact on the industry um, since this kind of tale of the two cities happened um, back in 2008 when we started to see these trends occurring. And I think it's quite relevant to kind of call this out now because it, it means quite a lot for the middle of growth, uh, middle uh, retailers where we're trying to be everything to everyone and have good, better, best strategies. They're the ones that tend to get impacted most by these these changes in people's um, financial circumstances being quite extremely changed. So what does this mean? So um, we've grouped some shoppers together here for a more disposable income and less disposable income. Now, some of this is, 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 is fairly um, common things that we would see happen. So people have got more disposable cash. They're more likely to spend a bit of money on luxury products, gifts, they're less sensitive to price increases and then they're more potential, not necessarily will, but they've got more potential to trade up and to trade up to a, a more expensive supermarket or to trade up to a more expensive um, mobile phone package or to trade up to um, more TV channels or whatever it might be. You then got the less disposable um, income household. And they're more likely to be trading down and going the other way, losing more own label products, obviously more sensitive to pricing thresholds more likely to buy products on promotion. Um, they're probably more likely than the more disposable cash to, try to switch supermarkets. So maybe moving to more discount outlets. And these, these shoppers as well will also be the ones that are more likely to be reviewing their phone, broadband and TV suppliers. And actually the sl next slide will say that's 15% of um, shoppers are, are more likely to do that now than they were before. And there's also, I've got a stat to show that actually there's an even higher amount that say they're, they're going to be switching this year. So a lot more customers that they need to um, actually replace in those sort of telco industries. So where are the where are the places that people are cutting back? So again, this is part of a, a custom piece of um, research that we've um, commissioned, is that around 39% of shoppers tell us they are shopping around more for the best deals than they did previously. And I think there's two things that are coming out of this. Now, one of them is that some people are um, not as uh, well off as they were prior to the pandemic, but also because of the growth in e-commerce, there is this element of people are now aware that they can, and we look at retailer sites more often. So they will look at where they can get the cheapest prices, this whole ROPO impact of reviewing online, purchasing offline has become even more prevalent during the pandemic as more and more people use e-commerce, not necessarily to shop from, but as a reference point to where they can find the, the best deals. We then got three other things that we called out. So um, uh, one in five of uh, the consumers that we surveyed said they were trading down to cheaper brands. That's quite a lot that are switching to um, buying less um, expensive products. And the 15% and as I mentioned are moving uh, and shopping around more for TV broadband and mobile packages that are better deals. And 15% um, are moving more, more to private label and uh, own brand products. Now, if we look at the flip, some of these um, numbers aren't quite extreme. So 
people maybe are holding back a bit more. But 12% of shoppers tell us they are more likely to treat themselves to those luxury products. But only 5% are saying they're actually purchasing more premium products, which is much smaller than any of the other numbers that we've seen so far. So not a huge amount there of people that are purchasing more and trading up to more premium brands. So we've looked at spending attitudes we also look to lifestyle attitudes because these sorts of things will impact demand. So if circumstances changing, demand may increase or decrease accordingly, and therefore demand is going to be something that will impact um, inflation and cost prices going up. If there is more demand for something, then you can charge more for it, as uh, Ingo demonstrated earlier. So what we have here is these were six questions that we asked about, do you insert line here, more than you did prior to the pandemic. So the first one is uh, one in five, sorry, one in four of us cook from scratch more. And then also one in four of us look for healthier products than they did prior to the pandemic. And you can look at things like the plant-based um, revolution, you could say that we're seeing at the moment and more people buying more plant-based food. Um, those two uh, consumption habits will have changed massively during the the pandemic, cooking from scratch more because there's more home cooking, something to do, hobby type environment. Um, so that's kind of your, your kind of consumption side of things um, from uh, changes in habits. Then your next two ones, we look at 22 and 16% of I purchase more food than before for extra occasions, such as working from home lunches and commuting less. So there is an element of people that have to travel less and they are not going and potentially eating out a, a, a uh, a convenience store to get their lunch or to eat at a Starbucks or whatever it might be. So there is this element of people don't need to leave the house and they will bring food home to, to consume. Then one in 10 people said that they've actually started to purchase new categories that they hadn't before. And then 10% said they spend more on alcohol, which is quite surprising if you think that pubs and restaurants have been shut and there's kind of less occasions potentially to to um, consume alcohol out of the out of the house now those sorts of things probably for some people aren't necessarily surprising um, depending on who you are what i think is really interesting though is that if i overlay some demographic information looking at higher earning households we can see that those households have been impacted with a, a more extremely so they are almost twice as likely no longer to commute um, for work um, and then they are more likely in all of the other situations to have changed um, their lifestyle situations in those six areas more than they did prior to the pandemic so one in three are more likely to cook from scratch um, are pretty much the same for the next two as well for the next three as well really and I kind of want to call out that there may be some new opportunities for people who can um, can see them so maybe more premium at home consumption for lunches for example or how can you expand the scratch cooking category to um, incorporate your products more into them those sorts of things um, and if you think about outside of grocery it's it's what can i be doing to um, encourage more more high um, affluent um, more higher earning households to um, up trade and buy a more expensive product that I'm selling. So what happens next? So we've got four predictions of things that we, um, some of that we know that's happening, but this is what we see being the key factors for the next period of time as we come slowly out of the pandemic is that if the last recession doesn't need to go by, we will see some key shifts. So um, people moving retailers and sticking with potential retailers, sticking with potential products and plans and packages that they've purchased. This is the time that people are really going to start to make those movements. We know that there's going to be more pressure, and this is specific to grocery, looking at middle retailers who try to be um, everything to everyone to get their ranges right. And off the back of it, there's going to be a big shakeup of range and assortment so that they can streamline their supply chains potentially, um, also to look at how they can make sure their uh, uh, ranges are well placed from a pricing perspective to appeal to uh, multiple um, shoppers, so the higher end and, and the lower end. Um, and then you also think of um, 
how e-commerce needs to be made more profitable. We know that it's a big shift that would have happened out of this recession. Um, how, how can we continually capitalize on that and make it more profitable? Because that's the key challenge that most of um, most companies are having. So what is it that we can start to look at? And what is it we can do about it? So number one, and it's hot on everyone's agenda at the moment, is get the revenue management side of things right. Get your channel strategy sorted. Get your uh, price pack architecture strategy prioritized. So make sure you've got the right pricing in place, the right products that appeal into those um, more and less affluent um, households. There are going to be shakeups in whatever industry you're in. There's going to be shakeups in terms of um, what suppliers are being sold where, what products are being sold where, um, and they're going to start streamlining those processes or bringing in new streamlining those ranges or bringing in new products that may be more fit for, for the changes in lifestyles. Now you have to be ready for that. So be ready when a retailer comes to you to say that you're going to be delisted. Um, we recommend that you kind of need to be on the front foot for that. And also use these changes in lifestyles and circumstances to your advantage. Have you got a, a, a product that appeals that's more of a, an economy product? Do you have a product that's a more premium? Is this the chance to, to actually try and launch those products into certain ranges where there is a gap available? So really get on the front foot with those sorts of things. And look at it from a pricing perspective for your current range, getting it right in the aggregate. So you can't be the right price for every single uh, consumer, but you need to be able to get the right price point that will win the most consumers. And those are the sorts of things to, to, to consider for, the, for the, the next period of time coming through the and out of the pandemic. So I'm conscious of time. So um, I'm going to just move on to uh, questions that anyone might have. And I think we've got a few uh, moments, Inga. I don't know if you've got any questions that have come through here on the chat. So one second. Yeah, Th thanks for, for the presentation, uh, very interesting. And so the first question, do you think that it's a global or local trend? I mean, would have... As a different elasticity variation yeah. scenario ah. across the yeah. world. Um, yeah, yeah, we can't say that um, every single country is gonna be a different stages the pandemics are impacting different countries differently um and um, you do have to look at uh, elasticities and um sensitivities i probably should say um and the best way to do that is 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 look at um areas that you can um look at ways that you can actually understand using your latest data sets available what is the sensitivity currently as i look at it now rather than looking at data from a year ago um, you know, let's look at look at look at what the latest data is telling us in terms of sensitivities in the market, and commission some sort of, and commission um, piece of research of, of those. Um, yeah, uh, lots of these similar questions. I don't know if you anything you want to build on that, Ingo. Yeah, it's it also the second question. How is this elasticity trend in FMCG industry in Europe? Um, so, so we in our study we, we looked a bit across different industries, and we we saw the the general trend. Um, in the same direction that we saw here. So a decline in willingness to pay of some people and an increase uh, for others. Um, so the, I think that the general direction we will we would expect in many cases, and we also see this in, in, our, in our daily work. Um, but of course, to, to actually make price decisions, uh, you, you have to analyze your, your, your specific data. Um, to be sure um, what 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 the trend is and if elasticities or price sensitivity overall has increased or, or decreased in, in your specific market. Uh, David, so what what data do you usually use for for this kind of uh, which they say so you, your number one is your, is your sales data. Um, it's what people do. <laughs> Um, so a combination of what people do and what people say is important, um, but mainly looking at sales data to understand the reactions to price changes historically, um, but also look at the most recent data available. So one of the things that we find is that people are using analyses based off of that's a year old, 18 months old. So much has happened in the last year that you kind of be, need to be looking at your data much, much more frequently and scenario planning weekly off of data that's at least one or two months old, maybe that you should be looking at. Yeah. Um, 
I haven't seen any more questions, but I'm conscious of time. And I did want to tell people about uh, the uh, next webinar that we have on the 16th of June. I've posted the link into the chat. Um, and if there are any questions I didn't see within the chat, we'll make sure we follow up after today's sessions with you directly. Um, but the session in the 16th of June will be successfully designing your product categories, where we'll be looking at things like range resets, D-lists, and how you can look to combat them. But also we'll be focusing on um, price pack architecture, and making sure you've got the right range in place um, for the next stage of, of consumer behavior. So um, thank you everyone for your time. And uh, we will answer any other questions in the chat directly. And um, we hope to speak, see you all again soon. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend. Uh, David, don't be too sad next week. Um, <laughs> after, the, <laughs> after the match, everyone else, uh, have a good week. And thank you. Goodbye. I've just put the. Uh, for those still there, I've just put the um, invite for the session in a few weeks' time in the in the in the chat. Great, thanks everyone.